Greetings, church. Thank you for joining us for this time of Easter worship. My name is Josh, and I have the privilege of serving as the pastor here at Belfield, and we are glad that you have joined us for this time. Especially if this is your first time or you're new to Belfield, thank you for doing so. Please visit our website, which is belfield.org, and the social media links that we have there to find out more about who we are and access some good resources there. Especially check out the Connecting at Belfield page. We have people who would be glad to get in touch with you, hear a little bit more about your story, and get to know you. It's been an interesting Holy Week for all of us, though it's still a privilege to be able to worship the Lord together and celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. A little word about today's service. Uh, first, we would invite you to see this as an opportunity for participation and not merely observation. I know it can be a little awkward to sing songs in your own home, but join us as we do so. See the times of prayer as times in which you can pray. If you're watching this live with us on Sunday morning, we'd also invite you to, to check in and say hello to one another, share any prayer requests that you may have so that we, we can be praying with and for one another during this time. Uh, the service today will be done like our services have for the last couple weeks. That is, you will see some of our staff, our elders, members of the congregation leading segments of this service from within their own homes. This is what it looks like for all of us right now. We are in this together. You will see musical leadership from each of our three different services, get to hear some of the different styles that are there. And we are privileged and thank you uh, to all those who have helped to put this together. Now, uh, typically on Easter Sunday, we begin our service with a call and response, celebrating the good news of this day. We're gonna try that again, and I will be getting some help from our staff, our elders, some of our college students, and some of our kids. So, here goes. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen, he is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen indeed. Let us enter now into this time of worship. Good morning, Belfield family. Happy Easter. We are going to start this morning with a call to worship. And if you would like to join in with us, we would love for that to happen. So join with us as we read Psalm 57, 8 through 11. Awake, my glory. Awake, O harp and lyre. I will awake the dawn. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations, for your steadfast love is great to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Would you join me in prayer? God of life, we praise you for the miracle of Easter. We pray for the great joy for ourselves and for all who join in worship to celebrate Jesus' resurrection. We pray especially for those whose lives are filled with pain, loss, sadness, or anxiety. May we all see the resurrection as our source of great hope, and may Jesus Christ be exalted this day and every day. Amen. Amen. Now let's turn together in reading God's Word, Luke 24, 1 through 12. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. At, and as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified on the third day rise. And they remembered his words, and returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them, who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. Death, where is your victory? 
Where is your sting? Christ the Lord is risen today. Field. Uh, happy Resurrection Sunday. I'm happy to be worshiping with you today. Um, I know that right now there might not be a lot of hope in the world, uh, but we can remember that because of what happened today, uh, because of Jesus's resurrection, uh, that we will be lifted up, uh, that no matter what our circumstances are, that uh, Jesus is our victory. Uh, would you sing with me? Victory, no praise will 
in vain was borrowed for three days. His body there would not remain. Our God has a robbed the grave. Our God has a robbed the Jesus from the grave, you shattered the power of sin and death. We confess that we remain captive to doubt and fear, bound by the ways that lead to death. We overlook the poor and the hungry and pass by those who mourn. We are deaf to the cries of the oppressed and indifferent to calls for peace. We despise the weak and abuse the earth you made. Forgive us, God of mercy, help us to trust your power to change our lives and make us new that we may know the joy of life abundant given in Jesus Christ, the risen Lord. Amen. And now for our assurance of pardon from Romans 8, 1 to 2 and 11. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ, for the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus, from the law of sin and death. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give you life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Hi, Belfield. We're happy to be with you today. I'm Kathy Emmons. This is my husband, Eric. That's Katie Rose. We're happy to be celebrating the resurrection of Jesus with you. And let's sing.
Good morning, Belfield family. I'm Matt Rader, and this is my wife, Emily, and we're regular attenders at the 11 a.m. service. Please join us for a scripture reading in a time of prayer. Please turn with me to Job 19, 23 through 27. Oh, that my words were written. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book. Oh, that with an iron pen and lead they were engraved in the rock forever. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. My heart faints within me. Please join us in prayer. Father, we come before you this morning, joyful that your son is risen, but sorrowful that our world is broken. We pray that you would just be present in each of our lives, each of our hearts, each of our families, each of our neighborhoods, our cities, our nation, our world. Lord, we know you're here. We know your kingdom is come, but not yet in its fullness. And in this time where our whole earth is ravaged by an illness, we pray that you would come as the great healer, heal our land, heal those that are sick, and most of all, heal our hearts, Lord. Give us hearts to seek after you. Father, this morning we also pray for and lift up Meg Van Dyke's friend, Brett Lynn, who lost her father this past week due to complications with COVID-19. What a tragedy. Father, we ask that you would put your arms of love and peace and comfort around her and her family as they grieve. May they know and sense your presence and the peace that comes from knowing your presence in the midst of this incredibly difficult time. Father, amidst all the reminders of sickness and death, we praise you that hope springs eternal. We praise you for the new life, for the healthy arrival of Jack Frederick Burroughs, of Lauren and Jim. Jesus, great physician, we ask for the continued healing and the power of your healing touch through your Holy Spirit to be on Caleb George and Stephen Lubinsky, that you would move in their midst and bring healing and restoration and give them a quick recovery. Father, as we lift up all those who are ill and suffering, we also remember Frank Raymond, who had surgery a few weeks ago and is now recovering in a rehab facility. We pray that you would restore his strength, build him up, may his rehabilitation be successful. We pray that you would just strengthen and heal him. Father, we thank you that you hear our prayers, that we can approach your throne boldly and confidently because Jesus has made the way for us. 
you know the needs, the worries, the concerns, the praises, the joys on the hearts of all of your people, the ones that were spoken today, the ones that were left unspoken. We lift them all to you. And thank you, Jesus, that you remain sovereign on the throne. Now, as we turn our hearts to give, Father, would you help us to be open-handed, knowing that everything belongs to you. May we be generous as we give. And God, that would you use our gifts to help us serve others and share the good news of Jesus Christ for your glory. We look to you and we love you and pray and ask all of these things in your powerful name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Our giving is always an act of worship, and especially so when times are difficult or things uncertain. Thank you to those of you who have continued to be so generous. It has enabled us to continue our ministries and also reach out to our community in some new ways. We invite you to visit our website, belfield.org giving. Online giving is the easiest way for us and for you at this time. In addition to your regular tithes and offerings, we have created what we call an emergency assistance fund. We know that there are some in our congregation and community facing critical needs at this time, and our deacons and elders are working to help identify those and offer whatever support we can. If you have questions about that or are in need of help, please email assistance at belfield.org. Thank you for your giving and for the ways that it glorifies the Lord. I invite you now to take a moment uh, in this offertory to prepare your hearts and your minds as we get ready to open God's Word together. Okay, it is time for us to get a little more deeply into God's Word together, so I hope that you have your Bibles out. We're going to hear this morning from someone who was an eyewitness to the events of that first resurrection morning, someone who was there when Jesus got up and walked out of the tomb, and someone whose life was changed forever because of that. I'd like you to turn in the New Testament to a letter that we call 1 Peter. It's near to the end of the New Testament. There will be in chapter 1. Peter, we often think of as somebody who was impetuous and headstrong, yet loyal. He was the first of the disciples to confess that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God, but also the first to reject this idea that Jesus might need to suffer. He denied Jesus, then he repented, and he wept over that. Peter was one who preached at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came in power, and there were thousands who became believers and were baptized. Everything that he had seen this morning changed him. 
And the letter that we have in front of us then is the mature reflections of someone who had spent their entire adult life following Jesus Christ. This is one of the letters in the New Testament that we call a Catholic letter, Catholic just meaning universal, because unlike some of Paul's letters, for example, it was not written to one specific individual or congregation. Peter addresses it to believers throughout the entire world. Church tradition has it that Peter was martyred in Rome by being crucified upside down, likely just a year or two after he wrote this. He speaks very powerfully, very directly, and he says some things that I think the church needs to hear today. Before we listen to those things, let me invite you to pray once more with me. God of life, your spirit raised Jesus from the dead. Your spirit inspired the prophets and the writers of Scripture. Your spirit draws us to Christ and enables us to acknowledge him as Lord. We ask that you send your spirit now to give us deeper insight, encouragement, faith, and hope through your gospel. And Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight. For we pray this in the matchless name of Jesus, our risen Lord. Amen. This is 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 9, and I invite you to listen again to the word of the Lord. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now, for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Whenever the world seems to be coming undone, the truths of the gospel are seen for the precious treasure that they are. One theologian wrote this, Truly, if there has ever been a time when the truth of God ought to be more freely and boldly maintained, it has never been more necessary than the present day, as all must clearly see. That's what John Calvin wrote to Edward VI, the King of England, in 1551, in the introduction to his commentary on 1 Peter. What does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus Christ in difficult times? How are we to face these things? Where do we turn, and how good is the good news of the gospel when we don't seem to see anything good around us? These are not new questions. They're important questions, and they're ones that have faced believers in every age. And Peter addresses them head on, and he begins by pointing us right to Jesus Christ. It's the resurrected and returning Jesus who is our living hope. Peter celebrates the new life that God has given us in Christ. Right at the beginning, he says, Blessed be God and Father, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy. According to his great mercy. God has not given us new life in Christ because we've earned it, because we deserve it, because he looked at us and saw more spiritual potential than in someone else. He did this freely, out of his great mercy. Right before this is where Peter said that it's God the Father, through his foreknowledge, that calls us in Jesus Christ. It's Jesus Christ who, through the shedding of his blood, cleanses us and claims us as his own. It's the Holy Spirit, then, that sets us apart in Jesus Christ so that we can walk in his ways. This is what it means to be born again. That expression sometimes gets used as if it only refers to a demographic subset of Christians. But it's what needs to be true for all of us. Jesus in John 3 said that we must be born again. And we're told that we are born into a living hope. We're born now into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There's a Chinese theologian and a professor in Hong Kong named Carter Yu who wrote a very uh, insightful analysis examining the individualism and the dualism that he sees in Western societies. And you said that there, in general, 
that there's no sense of hope for the future in Western societies. He says that we have a lot of technological optimism, but we're full of literary pessimism. That we forge ahead with these brilliant achievements and yet are full of nihilism and despair. Now, you wrote that 30 years ago, and I think the popularity of dystopian films and novels, the skyrocketing trends of anxiety, depression, and suicide, just confirm how deeply this malaise has set in. We have a living hope. Now, biblically, it's important to understand that hope has no element of uncertainty to it. When we use the word hope, uh, we are expressing uncertainty. It's just a, a wish, it's a longing, it's a desire for something that may or may not happen. So we say something like, man, I hope that my Wi-Fi can hold up under the ridiculous burdens I have been putting on it recently. Hope, biblically, has no degree of uncertainty to it. It is the sure and certain hope that God will make good on his promises. And the resurrection of Jesus Christ shows us that that is true, that God has made good on his word. That's why Jesus himself is our living hope. The resurrection of Jesus Christ, friends, is not just one Bible story on the shelf next to all the other ones. This is not the only Sunday of the year that we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's in 1 Corinthians 15 that Paul says, If Christ hasn't been raised, then everything we're doing is pointless. It's pointless. You are still in your sins. He said death still has the final word. But if Christ has been raised from the dead, then everything has changed. We have a living hope. And we receive this hope by faith. We believe, though we have not seen. Now Peter had seen Jesus Christ. He had walked with him, he had eaten with him, he had heard him preach, he had seen him heal the sick, give sight to the blind, even raise the dead. Peter had seen Jesus executed and buried. And then Peter saw him alive again. Now he knew that those were unique experiences that not everyone had. That's why when he writes here, you see in verses 8 and 9, he says, Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him. If you ever play peekaboo with an infant, you know that as soon as they can't see you, they despair. They have no idea whether or not you exist anymore. The understanding that someone can exist when you don't see them is actually a later stage of cognitive development. We can't see Jesus right now physically, not in the way that Peter did here on this earth. That doesn't mean he's gone. It doesn't mean he does not exist. There's a 10th century bishop named Ecumenius who once said, If you love him now when you have not seen him, but have only heard of him, just think how much you will love him when you finally do see him, and when he appears in glory. Our faith, Christianity, is not about just abstract spiritual principles. It's not even about uh, moral codes. It's about the saving actions of God in history, and it's grounded upon what happened when the Son of God walked upon this earth. In his great mercy, God has given us new life in Jesus Christ. We receive that by faith. That faith lays hold of Jesus Christ. It rests in what he has done. It also looks ahead to what Christ has promised and what we have in him. Our faith looks ahead to its inheritance. Now, when we, by grace, through faith, come to Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit unites us to Jesus Christ. And that union is so thorough that whatever's true of Jesus becomes true of us. So as the Son of God, he is the heir of all things. And now we share in that. That's why Romans 8 says that in Christ, we are heirs of God because we are co-heirs with Christ. Peter is rejoicing in that at the beginning when he says, Blessed be, because we have an inheritance. So, what is this inheritance? You can read verse 9, where he speaks of the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls, and think that it's just limited to something about our souls. Think that it just is a kind of disembodied, ethereal experience where we float around from one cloud to the other. That doesn't sound very exciting to me. In fact, I'm grateful that Scripture promises us something far greater than that. The bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ points us to what will be in store, what will be ahead. Because that same Jesus, 
when he returns, Scripture says, will usher in the new creation, the new heavens, the new earth. And part of that new creation will be our resurrected bodies. We're told that Jesus' resurrection is it's the promise, the pledge, even the prototype, if you will, of what will be true one day for all of his people. I love preaching on this, though I have to confess also that I feel like I have no idea how to preach on this. Because we're bumping up against the limits of human understanding and even language. Paul says that it's a mystery. It's a mystery. It's going to be beyond what any eye has ever seen or any mind has ever comprehended. So we look at the events of Jesus' resurrection. We see that when he was raised, it was him, and yet not in a way that the disciples had ever seen before. We are told that our resurrected bodies will be ours, yet not in a way that we have ever known them before. So too will the new creation be this world that we have known, and yet in a way that we have never known it before. Peter says that our inheritance is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. It's imperishable. I get a little uncomfortable with food that can never go bad. Twinkies, for example. I don't have anything against them. It just seems that if it's made of real things, it should go bad at some point. When you reach into the back of your refrigerator and you find that green, fuzzy orange, it's gross, but at least you know that's a piece of real fruit. Everything we know, everything, even styrofoam, is going to decay and break down at some point. Not so the new creation. It will be imperishable, more real than anything that we have ever known, never subject to decay or corruption. It will be perfect and perfected. He says also that it will be undefiled, completely free from any trace of sin or unrighteousness. If you ever go on a beach trip, when you come back, you find sand everywhere afterwards. If your kids ever do a craft with glitter, you find glitter everywhere afterwards. Our sin has, has so infiltrated and penetrated this world that it has affected every part of it. Not so the new creation. It will be entirely unstained and undefiled by those things that now ravage and corrupt our hearts and homes, communities, and countries. It's unfading, he said. Detergent companies always work to eh, promise you that their product will keep the vibrancy of the color of your clothes from diminishing over time. But they always do. They always do. Not so the new creation. Its brilliance and beauty will never cease to amaze us and will never cease to elicit our delight. This is the promise that we have. It's not here yet. Peter says it's ready, ready to be revealed in the last time. And don't worry about trying to calculate when that will be. You'll know when it will happen. Here's maybe the best part. This is being kept for us, and we are being guarded for it. This inheritance, he says, is being kept for you, and you are being guarded for it. I was reading earlier this week uh, that while many nations are scrambling to find enough personal protective equipment or medical resources to deal with the coronavirus pandemic, that uh, Finland is remarkably unworried. That's because Finland has some of the largest stockpiles in the world, not only of medical resources, but of oil, grain, agricultural tools, and raw materials. Like many European countries, Finland began stocking these things after World War II, and during the Cold War, they increased their stores drastically. Unlike most other European countries, though, Finland never stopped adding to it. So they now have these massive stores that are being kept for their people. Uh, just for the first time, the locations of them are secret. And just for the first time this past week, the government released a few images. Here's one. Kind of looks like Ikea, right? The locations are classified, as is their exact inventory. But these resources are being kept for the people of Finland. Verses 4 and 5 say this, There is an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. This inheritance is kept, it's maintained, it's reserved for us. 
And we, it says, are being shielded, guarded, protected for it. The Greek language that Peter uses here brings to mind the imagery of military fortifications. It is kept for us and we for it. It will be there and we will be there. Jesus Christ, our living hope, has secured for us an inheritance that cannot perish or spoil or fade. That's the good news. It's the good news that enables us to make it through the difficult times. And we need to know that because Peter also starkly reminds us of what we find all through Scripture, that our faith will be tested by the trials and difficulties of this world. It's important to understand the difference between temptation, trials, and tests. Now, God does not tempt us. He doesn't do that. James put it like this, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted, and he is lured and enticed by his own desire. So God doesn't tempt us. Our own sinful desires produce the temptations that we face. There are trials that come our way in life, however. There are challenges and difficulties that face us, things that produce sorrow, or persecution, or worry, or doubt. That's what Peter mentions because those trials are the things that test our faith. He speaks of the tested genuineness of our faith. It's a test that reveals the quality or the strength of a thing. Faith is refined in the furnace of trial. Peter uses simple imagery here and he compares it to gold. Do you, do you know how gold or silver are typically refined in traditional methods by a craftsman? They dig up a, a raw chunk of the material, a piece of ore from the ground, and it's full of impact, uh, imperfections and impurities. And they place that over a fire. The heat is turned up, and as the metal begins to melt, what rises to the surface are these impurities. They're called dross. And the craftsman scrapes those away. And then the heat is turned up a little more. And more of these rise to the surface. And he scrapes those away. Here's an image of some dross that is floating on the top of some molten silver. This process goes on again and again until all of the impurities and perfections have been removed. And the craftsman knows that it's done when he can lean over that metal, look in, and see his own reflection in it. It is through trial that our idolatries, that our insecurities are exposed and are removed. Look, we have to be honest here. It can be easy to say that we love and trust and obey God when things are good. When we have our health, when you have your job, your loved ones, or the respect of your peers, it's easy in those times to give thanks to God. But the truth is that usually we are not actually glorifying God. We're just basking in the comfort of our circumstances. It's a lot harder to love and trust and obey God when things are difficult. When you don't have your health, when you have lost loved ones, when you've lost your job or been told that your vocation is non-essential, when the economy tanks, and when all of our normal societal paradigms have been flipped on their heads, it can be much more difficult. It's also in those times that our deep sources of identity and allegiance are brought to the surface. We might not always like what we see. What has this pandemic shown you about where you put your trust, about where you look for hope, about where you turn for deliverance? I've had some times of trial in my own life that have brought some ugly things to the surface, and I'm still not thankful for the trials. Scripture doesn't tell us we have to be that, but I am grateful that God used those to remove some of those things from my heart. I've still got a lot of idolatry and insecurities in my heart. So do you. And these things are brought to the surface. And we see that our Lord is refining us. Often we don't realize this, though, until it gets exposed. The faith that this produces, though, the tested genuineness of it, is what Peter says is more precious even than gold because it brings glory and honor and praise when Jesus Christ is revealed. The griefs and trials of this world are real though they are not able to jeopardize the hope that we have in Jesus Christ, because our hope is Jesus Christ, the living one. And because we have a living hope, we have an inexpressible joy. 
It's the final idea I want to consider with you. Because we have a living hope, we have an inexpressible joy, even in the times of trial. Now, this does not happen if Jesus Christ is just a seasonal mascot or a decorative figurine or some collector's edition bobblehead that we put on the shelf in the corner of our heart. This only happens if we see him as the living Lord who rules and reigns now, who is our living hope and who enables us to reach out and serve others around us. The idea of serving others as Christ has served us is something that we considered on Thursday evening together. Peter says we have an inexpressible joy because of what Jesus Christ has done, what he is doing, and what he will do. Inexpressible there is not meant to, to indicate that we don't ever talk about it. Unfortunately, that is the case. It's inexpressible because there just aren't fully enough words for it. There's nothing else that can compare to this. The joy that we have in Christ is inexpressible. Last week, one of the things we considered was the difference between happiness and joy. Happiness is a kind of a responsive or reactionary pleasure to the circumstances in your life. So good things happen, enjoyable things happen, that produces happiness. Joy is something far deeper. Joy is a settled delight that is unaffected by any of the passing circumstances in life. And joy is anchored in our Savior. It's certain because he lives and will return in the end. I saw a headline in my newsfeed Friday morning that said, uh, five ridiculous things to keep you distracted this weekend. Things are crazy in our world right now, and, and there is an understandably strong impulse to just seek escape or distraction. Holy Week doesn't allow us to do that, and I'm grateful for it. It causes us to look directly at the reality of our own hearts, at the reality of our own world, and it addresses those things unflinchingly. The Christian faith makes sense of this world in a way that nothing else does. It accounts for the beauty and the horror of this world, because it says that this world was created by a good and loving God, and yet it has been defaced, vandalized by the rampant forces of sin and death. It makes us admit that we can't change this on our own. We're going to need somebody to act on our behalf. And then it celebrates that the God who created all things entered into his good but fallen creation for the purpose of redeeming us of our, from our sins and rescuing us from the grave through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it looks to this living Lord as our living hope who will return and get rid of all wickedness and sorrow and even death itself. Now, that's the good news of the gospel. And this is good news that demands a response. And we respond in faith, not, not just because it makes sense, but because we believe it's true. We respond in faith by confessing that Jesus Christ is Lord, believing in our hearts that God raised him from the dead. And if you've never done this before, do so now. Because, friends, if your hope is not in this, then it's not a living hope. Let's pray together. Great and gracious God, we bless you for the great mercy you have shown us and for the living hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Grant us the strength to endure trials, that the tested genuineness of our faith might shine more brilliantly than gold. Anchor us in the sure and certain promise of resurrection and inheritance, that we may rest in you, even as we rise to serve others in your name. To you, Father, Son, and Spirit, be all glory and praise now and forevermore. Amen. Hey, Belfield. Happy Easter. He is risen.
for this time of worship. Please be sure to check out our website and our social media feeds for more resources. We have Bible reading podcasts, uh, studies, lots of things to encourage and to strengthen you during this time. Friends, remember, 
Wherever you are and whenever you may be watching this, our worship is not complete until it goes out in loving service to others. So go in peace to love and serve the Lord and receive this benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Christ is risen! He is risen indeed! Thank you.